Well, you guys, I'm so excited to continue leaning into God's word about prayer. And as we wrap up our series called Whisper, uh, I just want to direct us back to our original scripture. We uh, just read it here on the live stream. If you're joining um, on demand later, let me read it again for us. It's 1 Kings 9, 11 through 12. It says this, the Lord said, Again, speaking to Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. Now, the ESV calls it a low whisper. The New American Standard Bible calls it a gentle blowing. The King James Version calls it a still, small voice. But we know that it was this gentle voice, this gentle whisper. And the question that's begged is, why would God speak in a whisper instead of in an earthquake or a fire, uh, a wind? And the answer, I believe, is because when someone whispers, you have to lean close to hear what they're saying. And we understand that prayer is not about getting stuff. It's actually about getting God. It's not about actually getting something from his hand. It's actually about creating intimacy with him. And so as we've been talking about for the last several weeks in this series, Whisper, we're looking at the idea of intimacy in prayer, that intimacy is God's goal in prayer. And really it is our goal to be intimate with him in the place of prayer. Because again, it's not about getting stuff. It's about getting him. Okay. So uh, today, as we talk about, you know, we're wrapping up 21 days of prayer today, I want to talk about what does Monday morning look like? Because, you know, for many of us, we've been going through this 21 days and we've been praying together in the mornings. What about day 22? What does Monday morning look like as we get moving forward? Because 21 days of prayer is not the end of something. It actually should be the beginning of something. It should be the kickoff to something, which is us continuing to pray. And I, I know that for pretty much all of us, we would probably ascend to the importance of prayer. We would all say prayer is very important. And yet, as we talk about the importance of prayer, right, it's so interesting to me that still, if we're honest, many of us struggle with wanting to pray. We're like, prayer is really important, but when it comes time to pray, we struggle to find the energy, the motivation to actually do it. And it's really interesting to ask, like, why that is. And uh, we believe here at Element Church that, that we believe that most people want to pray, um, it's just that um, they haven't been taught how to pray. And when you don't know how to do something, it's hard to want to actually do it. And so uh, today we want to remind ourselves that God in prayer is not looking for something from us. He's actually looking for something for us. And so I hope that even today, if you haven't yet over the 21 days or you haven't yet over 21 days past, that today would be a day that would inspire you to want to pray. And that as you would learn to pray, uh, your desire would increase to match up with what your mind already knows, that prayer is very important, but that your desire would begin to match that. And again, for our desire to begin to match that, we need to learn how to pray. Uh, we need some direction or education. And then also we're going to need some practice. And really when we talk about learning to do something, right, that's what we need. We need direction and education and we need practice. So our hope today is simply that, that at the, at the end of our time here, that this is not just a Bible study, but this is actually a trip into an experience with God, a, a, a relationship with God. And that as we're talking today about prayer, we're really talking about how we commune with God. And that today, by the end of our time together, you would really experience both um, a, a directive or um, a direction or have some piece of education, and then also that you would be inspired and given the tools to actually practice, okay? So as we're talking about day 22, as we're talking about Monday morning, as we're talking about 21 days of prayer is not the end of something, but the beginning of something, uh, I've got three kind of sections of thought for you today about prayer as we continue to learn and as we continue to practice, okay? I'm going to give them to you here right up front, and then we're going to walk through them. But really today, what I want to talk about is I want to talk about how we need to, on day 22, on Monday morning, we need to keep processing our prayers. We need to keep processing them. How do we discern and um, how do we interpret God's whispers? We're going to talk a little bit about that today. And then number two, how do we keep establishing habits? prayer habits. What? How can we keep doing that on day 22 on Monday morning? And then number three is how do we keep practicing? What does that look like? And I want to just give us a pattern for prayer. We've talked about some different patterns throughout the last month, but I want to give us another pattern that's really simple. And if you haven't got a pattern that works well for you yet, I hope and pray and believe that this will be the pattern that will give you the direction or education that you need and give you the tools that you need to practice. So 
Let's jump right in. Uh, number one, uh, as we talk about praying, guys, we need to keep processing prayers. Um, as we pray, we need to keep processing what the Lord is speaking to us because, you know, prayer is a two-way communication. And there are some uh, in, in Christ today that, that believe that, yes, we can pray, but God doesn't really speak back. He doesn't really unction back. He doesn't really lead back in, in that way. We really do believe that God is a speaking God. And we believe um, that God doesn't even need to speak audibly, that God can prompt, that God can uh, lead us to scripture, that God can bring people into our life to speak on his behalf. But there are ways we believe that God is whispering, that God is speaking. And so one of the tasks for a Christian, um, especially here at Element Church, uh, because again, that's the Christian that I'm speaking to right now, is that we need to continue to learn to process prayer. To, we need to continue to process God's whispers to us. How do I know if it's God or if it's bad gravy or pizza that I ate last night, how does that work? And I alluded to this last week, but I wanted to deep dive it a little bit more this week. I want to give you three words, and those words are revelation, interpretation, and application. Revelation, interpretation, and application. Let me say it like this. What was said by God? What, what did I discern? What was said? And then what was meant by what was said or revealed? And then thirdly, what should I do? with what was said or revealed. So number A, or <laughs> that's not a number, that's a letter, just checking, uh, make sure you're listening. But A, revelation. So those three words, revelation, okay? Revelation, what was said or what was revealed? Now I shared last week about a dream that I had where I was actually at my old house. We used to live in Williamson and I it was the, there was snow all over the ground and I was bounding through the snow in my backyard in my dream toward the fence. And I was trying to solve a problem. I don't remember what the exact problem was in the dream. And as I was bounding through the snow, I noticed kind of a large, dark cloud kind of thing over to the right of me. And as I was bounding, it kept getting closer and closer. And uh, I didn't have shoes on. I was bounding through the snow. I was very ill-equipped for what I was doing. And, um, and as I'm bounding through the snow, I had this sense like, hey, Scott, you're in a bad position. And I remember saying in the dream, we're church planters, we figure it out, which is basically like what church planters say a lot when you, you, know, you start a church, you're like, hey, we figure it out, which there's some truth to that for sure. But as I was bounding through the snow without shoes on toward a problem that I can't remember and I don't know how to solve and a black cloud coming toward me, I was like, basically like, we got this figured out. And right when I said, we're church planters, we figure it out, I felt that that cloud just rushed over me. It overtook me. And it was so startling and so drastic that I actually woke up and sat up out of a dead sleep. And that was the dream that I shared about last week. And so I wanted to take us back into that dream. So revelation. Okay, let's walk through this. Let's interpret this because we have to keep processing prayer. As I'm walking through, what was said or revealed? Well, I just shared all of that with you. So that's what was shared or revealed. The revelation was the actual dream. That was the, the actual part. I'm uh, there's snow. I'm bounding through the snow. I have no shoes on. There's a black cloud. There's a problem that I don't know how to fix, right? I'm saying, hey, we got this figured out. That's the revelation. I wake up. The next question, so that's what was revealed. The next part is interpretation. What was meant by what was revealed? Now, it's interesting because you could have taken that dream in a whole lot of directions, um, there's a lot of things that you could interpret out of that dream. And we talked actually about languages that God uses to speak in. We actually talked about that last week. And we talked about the Bible as the Rosetta Stone, uh, which is the fundamental way that we interpret what God is speaking, whispering to us, which is the scripture. That is the number one way that God speaks to us. And also the number one filter that we use to, uh, to understand the other languages that God is speaking to us. If you want more on that, you can go back and listen to that last week. It's on all of our media platforms on our app, which you should download. And it's all for free. But here's some filters that we can use to interpret the revelations that we receive, okay? Uh, what does the Bible have to say about that? And sometimes the Bible doesn't speak specifically to our situation, but the Bible may speak to the, the moral or theological uh, or spiritual or emotional things that are happening in our situation. So what does the Bible say about my situation? Another filter is, does it make me more or less like Jesus? That's always a good filter. I love that filter. When you're thinking about making a decision about something that you, that you received in Revelation and now you're trying to interpret it, 
hey, if I interpret this way, does it make me more or less like Jesus? If I interpret this way, does it make me more or less like Jesus? Um, is it continuous with what God has spoken to me before? Is it in continuation of kind of the, the thread and the direction of what God has done in my life before? Or does it just totally feel like it's way out of left field and it brings confusion and it brings anxiety? Now, that's not to say God can't ever bring anything out of left field. It can't, doesn't mean that God can't speak something new to us, but typically, uh, God, I believe, speaks in a continuity that that there are affirmations and that, and that even when it does come out of left field, there's not a confusion and an anxiety. There's actually a peace that comes with it. And I've had things in my life where God has spoken to me and it seemed way out of left field and yet it felt so confirmed and I had so much peace. It, it, it seemed like his voice. Um, another one. What do mentors and other voices around me that I respect think about this? So talking to other mentors, talking to other people in your life. Another one, does it align with peace? Do I have a peace about it? Or am I into that confusion? The Bible says God is not the author of confusion. And then, uh, and then does it align with the fruit of the Spirit? Kind of going back to that idea, does it make me more or less like Jesus? So does this help me grow into the fruit of the Spirit or does this actually take me further away? Those are all good those are all good uh, filters for me in my dream as I work to interpret that dream. Um, the, the dream, what, the revelation was the enemy's going to get me, right? There's this black cloud and it's coming and I'm walking through, I'm bounding through snow and I'm unprepared and the enemy is coming to get me. Now, there could have been a way in which God was trying to warn me of something specific, but as I prayed about that, I didn't have anything specific. But what I did sense was that there was fear involved. And so I was like, well, I know that the dream wasn't just given to me just to make me afraid, right? Because the Bible says that, that fear, um, uh, uh, I've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mindedness. And so I know that perfect love, the perfect love of God drives out fear. Those are both, those are two scriptures from the Bible. So I know that the dream was not given to me just for me to be afraid. So if it's not just for me to be afraid, as 2 Timothy 1, 7 said, which I quoted already, I've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power of love and of sound mind. That's not a fruit of the spirit. That's not peace. That's, so it wasn't a dream that was giving me revelation just to be afraid. So what should I do? So I talked with my wife about it. I, I processed and prayed a little bit. And what I finally got settled on was that it was a dream that was, in a sense, a certain type of warning, but it was a warning about me being self-reliant and self-dependent. I was bounding through the snow without shoes on. There was an ominous cloud that I seemed to care less about. I was going to solve a problem that I wasn't sure I knew how to solve. And out of my mouth, I said, we're church planners. We figured out, which is this little platitude. And again, there's truth to that. Um, you know, we want to be um, industrious people. We want to be people that adapt and overcome. But, but really what I sensed in the, the time of prayer and interpreting was I am being too self-dependent right now. And that in my self-dependence, I can put myself and other people in situations where we're vulnerable. And so what I, uh, what I sensed through interpretation was, God, I, where in my life right now in my leadership and in my life do I need to actually lean more into you and less into myself? That felt like a good scriptural interpretation. It felt like it gelled with the people that were around me that I was talking to. And it felt like it pointed me to the fruit of the spirit. It felt like it pointed me to repentance. It felt like it pointed me to God, to Jesus, to be to becoming more like Jesus and to, into deeper intimacy with God. And then that leads to C. So we have revelation, we have interpretation, we have application. Application is now what do I do about it? So uh, I want to remind us that proper revelation and interpretation, so you can get the first two right, that does not necessarily dictate clear application. It's critical to discern how to apply something and when to apply something. Um, so I, I wrote this down. A true revelation applied incorrectly has the same result as a bad revelation. So in my dream, my application was, as I alluded to, simply to press into God more and figure out where in my life was I being self-dependent and where in my life did I need to uh, rely on him in greater ways. Let me give you another example of a different situation that illustrates this application um, years ago, we, uh, I'm going to tell this story really quick without a ton of detail just for the time's sake. But um, years ago, we were actually in a situation where we were at a church and we were sensing God telling us to move to another state and go to another church. 
And there was incredible confirmations around this. Like I had people, I had two different people that actually approached me and talked to me about it. Um, I was on a trip at the time. When I got home, I walked in the door and I was like sensing like, oh my goodness, I have to talk to my wife about potentially moving because I'm really sensing this stirring. And our daughter at the time, who was seven, asked me if we were moving to that state within 10 minutes of me walking through the door, totally unprompted. It was, you guys, it was crazy. There was so much stuff that was being confirmed. My parents um, texted me that, like the next day, they were looking for property, uh, potentially to buy a house in the in the town that we were talking about, uh, sensing God speaking to us to move to, but it was totally unrelated. They didn't know anything about what we were talking about. So it was over and over and over again. And so that was the revelation was God was stirring something up and it was coming up over and over and over again. It was very powerful. And as we, that was what was said, that was what was being revealed. And then as we began to interpret it, it sure seemed like the clear interpretation was we were supposed to move and go to this other church. But as we began to get into application and we began to talk about moving, it, we, we were willing to take uh, you know, an adventurous step and go out and do it. But we, we just couldn't quite get settled. And again, leaving out a lot of detail, what we ended up doing was through the process of revelation and then interpreting and trying to figure out application through that process, we felt like the Lord confirmed in us that we weren't supposed to move to that other place and to that other church in that other state, but that we were actually supposed to take what was happening in that other place and bring it back here. And now what's really interesting, right, is you go, well, how did you get there from, from moving? And I could walk you through all of the application points of how that happened. But here's what God confirmed in our hearts at the back end of the process. We would have never received the additional revelations and the additional interpretation and the additional application that we did receive if we wouldn't have walked through the process of really believing that God was potentially asking us to move. And so what I want you to see is that there are times when we receive a revelation that seems pretty black and white, but as we go into interpretation and then especially as we move into application, we realize, God, what exactly are you doing here in this? Now, uh, just to close this out, I'll give you another example recently where my son came to me and said, I sense God is prompting me to this. And I wasn't even really sure about it at first. Um, and I went back to this example that I just shared with you. I was like, maybe God isn't speaking for you to do this, son. Maybe he's just wanting you to go on a process of interpreting. So we went on a process of interpreting together. And what we realized is that God was indeed speaking that. That was really our sense of it. We fasted, we prayed. And through interpretation and application, we made the move. So you guys, there's a lot here. There's learning his voice. And I understand that this is a process. But that's what we're supposed to be doing is learning and then practicing because we need to keep processing prayer. And again, remember, we have the scripture. We have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. Does it make me closer or further away from Jesus? Is, is it consistent with the fruit of the Spirit? Do I have peace about it? What do the mentors in my life say about this? And we process through revelation, interpretation, and application. Now, I want to, before I move to point two, I want to just throw this last little note out. What do we do when we need to make a decision and we just aren't sure? Now, this is assuming that we've gone through a scriptural filter, that this isn't something in violation to God's word, right? Morally, emotionally, uh, otherwise, right? Theologically. But what about like, you know, a situation where there's two good decisions in front of us, we've prayed, we've sought counsel, and we're just not sure, but the deadline for that decision is coming down the pike. We've got to make a decision. And I will tell you that there have been a few times in my life where I've been forced to make a decision and I did not know exactly what the Lord wanted me to do. I didn't have a sense about that. I actually still felt unsettled about it. And this is what I did. And maybe there's other ways to handle this moment, but for me, this is the way that I have found handling it. What I do is I remind myself and remind God, God, there's these two decisions in front of me, or there's this decision in front of me. I want to make the decision that is pleasing to you. So I start in a posture of surrender and I start in a posture of obedience to God. And I say, God, I want to do this right. I want to follow you. I, I want to make the right decision in your eyes. And so God, I'm reminding myself and I'm reminding you, God, I'm submitted to you. I'm obedient to you. God, I want to make this decision in your leadership and your guiding and your perfect will. God, I want to do this the right way. I think that's really important to stay in that posture. 
The second thing that I do is I remind myself and I remind God that there's a timeline that's coming. Hey, God, you know this, but I've got to make a decision on this day, whatever it is. You know, I got to make a decision on that date at this time, and I got to make a decision and I got to move. And then uh, I remind myself and I remind God again, I'm not really reminding him, but just praying this out in a, in a place of prayer. I communicate the decision that I'm going to make unless there's further clarity from him. And I just say, God, I want to make this in surrender and obedience. Um, God, you know that the timeline is coming and God, here's the decision that I'm planning to make. God, unless you give me something else, it's clear something else that you want me to know, God, this is the decision that I'm going to make. And then, um, Lastly, I communicate God's permission to redirect me if I make a decision that isn't in line with what he wants. And then guys, and then I make the decision and I go and I move because here's the thing. Sometimes God has a a perfect will, a, a perfect decision for us to make. And sometimes I believe that both of our decisions are in the permissible will of God. It's, God is like, hey, I'm good with either decision. It's okay. And I, and I really do believe this. If we make those decisions in prayer and communication with God, in a posture of surrender and humility and honoring him and asking him to direct and guide us, I believe even if we make the wrong decision, um, that he can direct us and get us back on the right path. So that's been helpful for me. I hope that's helpful for, for somebody out, out there. Um, number two, uh, let's move to number two, and I'm going to move through these a little bit quicker, but we need to keep establishing prayer habits. And I'm going to give you three quick things, the priority of prayer, the place of prayer, and the plan of prayer. Uh, here's the reality, you guys. Habits eat willpower for breakfast. And for many of us, we want to pray. We want to be people of prayer, but we try to be inspired into that, or we, we try to have willpower into that. And the reality is that habits will eat willpower for breakfast every single time. And planning to failing to plan is planning to fail. I know that sounds like a cat poster, but um, but in, in any area of our life, our, our budgeting, our marriages, cleaning our bathrooms, working out, being physically active, if we don't have a plan and we don't set habits in place, our willpower is going to fail us every single time. So here's what we need to do. We need to, A, we need to make a priority, uh, a priority of prayer. We need to set prayer as a priority. So we make food a priority. I've talked about this in the past. We plan it. We, we, we go to the grocery store. We have recipes. We, we take time out to eat it. What if we, just the way we plan our food and we have habits around that, what if we planned prayer around that? Because there's a power in setting habits and actually prioritizing the things that matter most. We often think about moments in our lives, but God's kingdom often is about process. It's not just about willpower, moments of willpower, sheer will and grit. It's actually about setting a process in place that gets us where we want to go. I've often heard it said that the battle with the Oreos is not made at the pantry. It's made in the aisle at the grocery store. I also heard someone say one time, they said, if you want to eat less food, don't try to have willpower to eat less food, although that could be helpful. They said, get smaller plates. And statistically, if you study it out, if you get a plate, a dinner plate that's 30% smaller, you, you traditionally, typically will eat less food. What small disciplined change in your habits do you need to make in order to prioritize prayer in your life? For some of you, you need to go to bed earlier. You just need to say, it's a habit of mine to go to bed earlier. For some of you, you need to get up earlier. It's just a, and, and maybe you go to bed earlier so you can get up earlier. But for some of us, it's getting up earlier. For some of us, it's actually creating a worship play, pray, uh, playlist that we can play while we're praying in the morning. For some of us, it's just making a commitment to Bible reading in the morning or Bible reading at night before we go to bed or keeping a Bible on your nightstand. And when you wake up in the morning, you read it. When you go to bed at night, you read it. Um, but, but what is it for you? What, what, how can you put into habit formation, the priority of prayer? Okay. That's a great question. The second part of this is the place of prayer. Um, Luke 11, one says this, it says one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. And then after he had finished and then the scripture continues, but here's what I want you to notice. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. Jesus had a certain place that he was praying. Now, for uh, for a lot of uh, people in the Bible, there was places that they prayed. Uh, none more obvious maybe than in Exodus 33 uh, with a man named Moses. And, and there was a place called the Tent of Meeting. Now, here's what I want to draw your attention to. The Tent of Meeting was a place. It was actually a tent. And it was outside of Moses's normal routine. It was a place that was set aside for Moses to meet with God. Let me read it to you. Exodus 33, 7. It says, now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. 
Again, Exodus 33, 7. Moses then has a kind of a rhythm and routine to his day. He has a place he's going, but he has this place outside of his rhythm and routine that he sets aside to meet with God. If you skip ahead a couple verses, Exodus 33, 11, the first part, it says, the Lord would speak to Moses there face to face as one speaks to a friend. And then continuing verse 11, it says, then Moses would return to the camp, but his young age, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Now, here's what's so interesting. Moses had a place. He would go outside of his normal routine. He would meet with God. And then it said Moses would then come back. But Joshua, who would actually lead the Israelites next, actually would stay in the tent. He would hear Moses praying to God. And he was fascinated by this. And he learned from watching the older generation how to pray. That's really cool. And I just want to set a, a moment here just as a side note. Hey, parents, grandparents, did you know that the younger generation, they're watching you and they can hear you? And it's important for you to set the priority of prayer, but it's important for you to set a place of prayer. Now, that doesn't mean we can't pray everywhere, right? But there's something about Jesus prayed in a certain place. There's something about Moses having a tent of meeting. And there's something special, I believe, when we set aside a specific place for us to pray. So here's what I want to ask you. Where's your place? Get a place. Get a tent. For Moses, it was a tent. For Jesus, it was a certain place. It was a certain garden. He would go to the Garden of Gethsemane often, right? For, um, for a story that I've heard recently, it was a, a, a gentleman that had a rocking chair. And every day he would sit in his rocking chair. I know another story I heard for someone's wife, it was a McDonald's. She would go to a certain McDonald's um, and she would pray. She would open her Bible and it was the place where she met with God. Um, for, uh, for John Maxwell, it was a rock in a, in a place that he would walk. For my pastor, Pastor Matt Keller, it's a chair and a Denver Broncos blanket, uh, which, you know, Denver Broncos blanket, I, he lives in Florida. So you can do the math on that. But it's a place. For some of us, it's a bench. For some of us, it might be a couch. For me, at this season of my life, it's a white and gray chair in my sunroom. But wherever it is, get a place. You need a place. And it needs to be a place that's in your habits, but outside of your daily rhythm and routine. Um, years back, I would, um, I still do it sometimes when I'm worshiping, I actually will be worshiping and, and I'll be lifting my hands and then I'll end up doing this number while I'm worshiping. And um, some people have asked me, why do you do that? What is that? I mean, that's not a biblical worship position. Hands up is uh, this isn't really in the Bible anywhere. And I said, well, in my old house in Williamson years and years and years ago, I used to pray in the basement and the ceilings were low and I'm decently tall. And so when I would worship, I would, I couldn't do this. So I would have to actually do this this and it ended up being like this. And for years I would just pray in my basement and I would worship and I would walk around this way. It was a way for me to lift my hands without lifting my hands. And what I have found is that the habit of that actually, you guys, has actually gone on. I'll still find myself in worship sometimes doing this. And here's the thing, because it was my place of meeting. It was my tent. And so uh, Matthew 6, 6 says, but when you pray, go into your room close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Now, whether that's your room, whether that's a rock, whether that's a chair, whether that's a McDonald's, whether that's a rocking chair, a couch, a bench, a walk in the woods, I don't know what it is for you. But here's the question, where's your place? Where is your room? Where is your certain place? Where is your tent of meeting? You need one. It can be public, it can be private, but you need one. Where is it? And when are you doing that? Where's the priority of prayer and where's the place of prayer? And that leads me to the third one is the plan of prayer. The plan of prayer. And this is number three. We want to have a plan of prayer. Now we've shared a lot of different kind of mod models and patterns and things like that. I actually spoke on that two weeks ago uh, on the Lord's Prayer. You can go listen to that online as well. But today I wanted to share a very, very simple one with you. I've kind of titled it the PhD of prayer. It's kind of a fun way to remember it, but it's very, very simple. It's present your praise, present your heart, present your day. P-H-D. Present your praise, present your heart, present your day. And if you don't know how to pray and you've never really gotten into prayer, again, during 21 days of prayer, we do a lot of praying and there's people that are praying and leading us and you can pick up a lot and you can catch a lot. But if you've never been a part of that and you're like, I just really don't know where to start and how to start. This is a simple way to do this. Present your praise, present your heart, present your day. So 
It goes something like this. And I'm just actually going to close us out uh, in our time kind of praying through this so that not only can we experience it together, but so that you can actually uh, receive the prayer, right? We can, we can actually pray together, uh, as we, as we close here and move into a time of worship. But, um, before I move us into prayer, I just want to remind us that you guys, I know that most of us assent to the importance of prayer, but still many of us struggle to do it. And I, I really do believe that for many of us, it's because we've never been taught how to pray. And so I, I, my, my prayer and my belief today is that you learn something, that you learn something about how to pray today. You learn something about how to, to build habits today. You learn something today about prayer. And then also today that you would continue to practice and that you would learn some things today that can help you practice prayer. Because we believe in prayer. God doesn't want something from us. He wants something for us. And prayer is not about getting something from God specifically from his hand. It's actually about getting him, getting intimacy with him. And so as he's whispering to us, guys, we're going to continue to be a church of prayer. Let me close us in uh, leading through the PhD of prayer this morning. And I'm actually just going to kind of pray in the first person and, and just uh, talk to God and you just do it right along with me. You can just do it with me. And, uh, and we're going to pray here together as we close for this morning. So father, we thank you for this morning and God, we come to you. And first we just present our praise. God, we, we praise you and we worship you. God, you are the creator of all things. God, you are the one that created the heavens and the earth with a spoken word. God, with your breath in Genesis one, you spoke a word and God, all time, space, and matter came into existence. So God, we praise you, God, for your power. And we praise you for your creative ability. God, we praise you for the God that you are. You are the one that oversees our lives. God, you're the one that gave us breath in our lungs. And God, as our heart beats that you will withhold and sustain. And God, as the, as the lungs that you created, breathe the breath that you give us in and out. And God, as the breath that you gave us actually forms over our vocal cords, God, we use all of it to say, God, we praise you and worship you. We honor you. And God, this morning, God, we honor your presence. God, we thank you that your presence is with us and we praise you, God, because you're a God who who didn't stand off afar and look at us in our need and just expect us to fix it. But God, you're a God who came. In the person of Jesus Christ, you came and you pushed through our sin and you came to meet our need. And God, we praise you today for your grace and your goodness. God, we remember, God, when we were uh, stuck in the miry clay, God, when we were in our sins. And God, you came and your grace and your goodness and your love pulled us out. And God, you, you pulled us out of the miry clay and you set our, our feet on a solid rock. And so God, I thank you for setting my feet on a solid rock today. God, I remember the day, God, that you saved me and pulled me out. I remember the season, God, when you began to speak kindness to my heart. And God, where I realized, God, about your holiness, but God, I also realized how far I fell short of it. And then, God, I realized your love and your grace that grabbed me and captured me there. God, we praise you for your love. God, we praise you for your salvation. God, we praise you for your son, Jesus, and his sacrifice for us on the cross. God, we praise you and we honor your presence today. God, we praise you for who you are. God, we honor your word today. God, we praise you for your word. God, the belt of truth that keeps us centered. God, God, in a crazy world when we don't know what to do, and we don't know what to believe. It's your truth and it's your word, God, that gives us, God, a, your word is a, a, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And God, we praise you for the truth that you've given us. God, we thank you for who you are today. God, we, we worship you and honor you and magnify. And we declare and proclaim out of our mouth today, out of my mouth today, God, that you are my God. I will serve you and I will honor you with my life. I honor you with my decisions. I honor you with my thoughts. God, I pray today you would help me, God, honor you with my eyes, God, with my ears, with all of my in gates, God, that I could honor you and worship you, God, with everything that I receive in. God, I pray that today I would praise you and honor you, God, with my words out of my mouth. God, I praise you with my thoughts, God, that you would purify my thoughts and you would purify the way that I process, God, that you would even create new pathways in my mind today, God, as I worship you and praise you. Oh God, you're a good God. You're good and you're true and you're wholesome and you're holy. And God, we praise you. And God, I worship you. God, I praise you for who you are. Jesus, this world has nothing for me. This world has nothing for me. It's only you in my life, God. And I thank you for that today, for who you are, for being available to me, and God, for loving me and caring for me right where I am, just as I am, but God, loving me too much to leave me here. 
And God, that moves me on from just praising and worshiping you for who you are and what you've done. And God, it moves me into a time where I present my heart. God, I presented my praise and now I present my heart. Oh God, would you search me and know me today? God, I pray, Holy Spirit, would you just search every room of my house? God, would you come anything, Jesus, that doesn't look like you, uh, act like you, smell like you, taste like you? God, any thought process that is in opposition to the way that you move or that you think, God, would you reveal it? Oh, search me, Holy Spirit, and know my every way. God, would you, God, come in and move? Would you reveal things to me, God, that aren't pleasing to you in order that I could see them today and God, I could repent and turn. And God, right now, I just take every sin, known and unknown, God, sins of omission, sins of commission, places where I've gone too far and places where I've not gone far enough. And God, I call them for what they are as I present my heart to you. God, I call the sin sin for what it is. God, I'm sorry for doing that thing or not doing that thing. And God, I would, <laughs> if I wasn't on a live stream, I would list them out one by one in this moment, God, just to say, oh God, I repent of them and I confess them to you. And God, I thank you that your word promises that as I repent to you and as I confess to you, God, that uh, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin to you, God, that you are faithful and just to cleanse us from our sin, God, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to put us back in right standing with you. So God, right now I repent, God, I confess of all of my sin, known and unknown. And then God, I ask you to come in and to replace in me, God, the broken places with your power. God, would you empower me to live a holy life? Because Jesus, Holy Spirit, without you, I can't do any better. I can't do this on my own. So I ask you to come in. And as I present my heart to you, and as I open myself up to you, I ask you to come in and to do your work in me. God, right now, as you forgive me, God, for the inexcusable in my life, I choose as an act of my will to, to uh, forgive those who have hurt me. So God, God, right now I bring before you anyone who's hurt me, God, anyone who has spoken ill will of me, God, any enemy that I have that, that, speaks, uh, that speaks against me, that seeks my harm. God, I bring them before you right now. And God, I bring my heart before you in regards to them. God, I do desire reconciliation. And God, as your word says, God, I desire to live at peace with all men and women as much as dependent upon me. But God, I know that that's not always possible. But God, what is always possible is maybe not reconciliation, but always forgiveness. And so God, I bring that situation. I bring that person. I bring my own heart before you in that situation today. And God, I ask you to empower me in the place of forgiveness. And God, I choose as an act of my will to forgive them. And God, as I forgive them, God, I not only, um, God, forgive them for what they did, but God, I actually walk through my own emotion and I forgive them for the way that they made me feel. God, they did something that hurt me. And so God, not only do I have to forgive them for what they actually functionally did, but God, I forgive them for the emotion that was placed within me, God, because of what happened. And so God, right now I bring before you all of that emotion, all of that shame, God, all of that anger, all of that, whatever it might be, the, the wounds, the, the hurts, the, the damage that was done. And God, I bring it before you. And God, I choose to forgive them for that. But God, I not only forgive them, God, I ask you now to replace in me what the enemy tried to steal from me. And so God, as someone has hurt me, they may not have even known what they've done. God, I forgive them. And then God, I, I, I remove their debt from my life. But God, there's still a hole there. There's still a gap there. There's still something there. And so God, I ask you to replace it right now. God, would you fill within me all the things that were stolen? God, in the places where someone spoke something over me and I was insecure. God, I thank you for your security within me today. God, as I bring my heart before you, I ask you to patch up my heart. And God, I thank you that I can be secure in you. I'm your son. I'm the son of a king. And God, I thank you that I don't need other people to approve of me or to speak well of me. God, I know that you approve of me and speak well of me. God, I belong to you and God, I'm yours. And I thank you, God, for moving in and replacing within me today everything that I need because you're a God of more than enough. So I receive from you right now all that the enemy tried to steal. And God, I receive back from you in those places. And God, as I've presented my praise to you and I've presented my heart, God, today I present my day. God, I thank you that this is an amazing Sunday. And God, I thank you today that we'll get to go out and love uh, as college students today. Today, God, from 4 to 8 p.m. tonight, and God, we'll get to share hope and love and grace. And God, I pray that you would speak to our team, God, that you would just begin to give us a discernment, God, that we could sense and see people, God, beyond what's in the natural, that we wouldn't just see people um, in the physical, but God, we'd be able to see beyond the veil and see where they're hurting, where they're struggling, where they're broken. And we would be able, God, to bring your words and minister to them in that place. God, I thank you for my family today. God, I thank you for my wife today. God, I thank you for my three children today. God, I thank you for 
for our finances today that, God, you meet every need that we have. God, as, we, as, as I'm presenting my day, God, I thank you that you are meeting every financial need that we have. You're a God of more than enough. You're the God who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. God, in heaven, pavement is made of gold. So God, I thank you that this is not a problem for you, that you, you in Christ Jesus, you meet all of my needs according to your riches and glory. And so God, I thank you for that as I present my day to you and my list to you. And God, if I wasn't on a live stream, I would continue to just make requests and petitions to you. And God, I would specifically ask you for the things that I need. Give us today our daily bread. And so God, I thank you today that as we're closing up this time together, God, we've been able to present our praise, to present our heart, and to present our day. And we thank you for that, God. And we ask that you would continue to help us stay in a spirit of prayer as we move into a time of worship. God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, you guys. Present your praise, present your heart, present your day. Let's continue to pray into a time of worship this morning. Have an amazing Sunday. We love you so much. And we'll see you back here next week.